Welcome to the Resume Storyteller, bringing you interviews with industry experts, regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land you job interviews. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hey guys, I am so excited to have with me today senior technical recruiter, Nicole Reyes. Nicole has spent more than 20 years in the Department of Energy industry as a technical recruiter, where she recruits engineers and scientists with active security clearances. Her experience also includes the recruiting for Department of Defense contracts. Passionate about recruiting, something she considers a calling, Nicole regularly schedules shares insights on the complexities of job search, interviewing, and recruiters on LinkedIn. Uh, Nicole, thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thank you, Virginia. I appreciate the opportunity. I, um, as I told you off, uh, off camera, there's just so much, there's so much complexities around job search and behind the scenes that goes on in the recruiting space. And my hope is that someone like you can help to peel back the curtain a little bit and, and explain it to all of us like we're in kindergarten. No, absolutely. I mean, I think sometimes I, you know, you forget when you're doing something for a long time, how difficult it can be for somebody who's not in it. And as I mentioned to you, people don't, people aren't often in the job search arena, you know, basically they find a job and then they stop searching and then they don't need to to be experts, right? Right, right, right. But so I, but I think it is like, it can be frustrating and overwhelming for people. So absolutely. I'm happy to help any way I can. So you, you heard a very brief overview um, that I shared on what you do, but I what I don't know is how you came to be in this position. So um, I kind of fell into recruiting, and I think you see it, you hear that a lot from recruiters. Yeah. And so I was in the banking industry after I finished college and did not like the banking industry and had a coworker whose husband was in um, the recruiting field and staffing. He worked for Kelly Services, so one of the big um, staffing mm-hmm. agencies. And um, there was an opening and I applied and got the job and just really almost instantly fell in love with recruiting. And so that was, you know, a long time ago, over 20 years ago. And so loved recruiting. And then a few years after that job um, was recruited to become a technical recruiter. And so I think it's a job. um, So I know people have really people have jumped into recruiting lately, especially because of the market in the last few years. I've had the privilege. It was a huge boom. It is. It really is. But I've been in recruiting since. um, Gosh, since like the mid nineties. So yeah, over 20 years, over 20th century. Yeah, no, that's the longest I've been working as well. Um, So you, so you started in staffing and then you pivoted to technical recruiting, um, which is the perfect segue for my next question, which is there are different types of recruiting. There's internal, there's contract recruiting. Um, And I know that that is a topic that confuses a lot of people. Can you explain the different types of of paths that recruiters can take for those of us. Sure. It might be the dark and where you, what category you fall into. Sure. And I think it does help people to your point, Virginia, if people know what kind of recruiter they're talking to, then it does help them better understand what kind of interactions they may have. Right. So that's right. um, So I think there's kind of three different groups. So there's an internal or what I'd call a corporate recruiter. And then there's like a contract recruiter. And that person could be, typically they may work for an agency or a recruiting firm. So like when I worked for Kelly Services, I worked for a temporary staffing company and it's Kelly Services. And so that was really me as a recruiter working with all these different clients who would call us to ask for a receptionist or we had these different contracts and we would work with specific clients and so when you're working on a contractor for a temporary staffing company or you're working for a staffing agency that really is what we would call an agency recruiter and so they have a number of different clients they have that they work with and support typically And then the third one, which is a little bit different too, is basically kind of recruiter who's out on their own. So I think maybe what you'd hear the term back in the day, the headhunter, you know, somebody who really Mm -hmm. works for themselves, who kind of set up their own shop and they may work by themselves or with a couple other recruiters that they've hired, but they get jobs from different clients and then they find, you know, find positions for them. So I I think there's kind of three types. I'm, I'm on the first one. I'm in the um, category where I'm an internal recruiter. I'm a corporate recruiter. So I work for my company, TechSource, and I only do work for TechSource. So I'm in the human resources department and I solely work with my hiring managers within my company. And so, you know, there, I think there's pros and cons. Um, I've done both. Um, I've done it 
in a number of different jobs. I think the benefit to me and what I like about being an internal corporate recruiter is I really do understand the company culture and I really do understand what the company has to offer. And once you build up that rapport and relationship with those hiring managers, then I think it's gold. I mean, they understand you, you know what they need, you understand the the dynamics that come with each hiring manager and what their pet peeves are, but also what they like. And so I think there's some real benefits. I think, you know, um, you do a lot of more variety perhaps on some level if you're doing agency or contract recruiting, but I think it can be harder. I think in some cases to really know the company culture and to really understand the nuances of that company. If you're doing it from like an agency perspective, if that makes sense, Virginia. It does. So somebody like when people say the word boutique recruiter or like a corn fairy, those would be in the agency space or would you consider yes. that the headhunter space? OK, um, well, you know, I think it, it, it sometimes can blur the line, to be honest, because yeah. headhunters. But in my mind, I mean, headhunters can be both in an agency or they could be the ones that just kind of go out on their own. Right. Who really work solely for themselves. And so, you know, the question would become, well, how do they make any money, Nicole? Well, they typically have. Um, so they may do direct placements, for example. So they may get a client who says, Nicole, you know, not my case, but, you know, if they were to talk to me, they'd say, well, you know, we want you to help us hire a director of HR. And then whatever that salary is, we, there would be agreed upon fee of 20 to 30 percent is typical of that person's okay. first year salary. So that's typically how um, headhunters or agency recruiters tend to work. So whether they're, you know, big like Corn Ferry or whether they're, you know, smaller agencies, that's kind of more their model. Okay, that is super helpful. I think you've probably just, I can feel a sigh of relief just having that broken down so basically because when you get contacted by someone, if they work internally, that's a very different ballgame than someone who's yes. got lots of different placements that they're dealing with. Okay, It does. And, um, and the commitment's different, right? I mean, and what they know about culture. And so it is, I mean, again, there's a whole host of different kinds of recruiters. But if you do, to your point, if you know who you're talking to, whether they're an internal corporate recruiter or whether they're an agency or, or boutique recruiting company, then you understand better kind of where they're coming from. You know, how many clients do they have? How many different companies do they service? which may have its benefit if you really are looking for that as a can as a candidate as a job searcher sure, versus sure you know, in terms of your your network maybe it yes. is good to have some agency recruiters because they do absolutely have their okay that that's super helpful so in your role you hire you work for tech source and you hire for highly technical and scientific roles so what is the biggest challenge that you find that these types of candidates face in terms of articulating their value to you and in and, and, and a job search in general? So I hire, yeah, as you said, I hire engineers and scientists. And typically, they're always U.S. citizens and they always have security clearances. So the truth is they're always in demand. And I've been doing this kind of recruiting for over 20 years specifically. And so I think the challenge they have is that they don't go out and look for jobs very often at all. And even when they are looking for work, they do it in such a different space than maybe other industries because it's such a niche space. And so they typically do it through passive recruiting, right? So they typically will be contacted by somebody looking for somebody with a security clearance and nuclear engineering experience or such. And so when they actually get laid off or there's something that happens and they really are having to actively look for a job, I think that overwhelms them because that's not been their experience. And I think that's I think that may be more uncommon with this group of people than it would be with like your average yeah. job seeker. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, no, it does. Um, I, because I I work with folks in this space as well. And um, usually I get I've never looked for a job. I don't even know where to start. I don't know yes. how to. Tell them. So that makes exactly. perfect sense. The other thing right. that I see, and I'm curious if you have observed this, is their documents are super, super technical. And, um, you know, not everyone can, the hiring manager, cer manager certainly can read that, but a lay person might not. And so and right. I don't know if that is, I imagine you, you and your role know understand those that terminology but I, I i would imagine that maybe sometimes there are more junior level screeners that don't understand the tech right and yeah and, and this and this brings up a great point too that i didn't even think about virginia but in the industry i work in <laughs> they hiring managers 
I know when the government, if you're depending on whether you're working as a contractor for the government mm-hmm. or if you're working as a federal employee or you're applying for federal jobs, they do want to see everything you've ever done since grad school. I mean, they really do. Yeah. And so those resumes may be six or eight pages, and that's not in any way an issue in this industry. So specifically within this highly, you know, technical engineering right. and science. Yeah, they, those federal resumes are yes, they're so, so long, right? They are. They are. And so it's really, so to, to your point, you know, they're going to list all their presentations, all their publications, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's going to look more like a CV, you know, to some people, for example, than it would a resume, but in the industry I work in, that's really common. And in fact, you know, you do yourself often a disservice if you don't list all the work you've done because they want to see right. if you were at Rocky flats back in the eighties, early nineties or early two thousands, or if you were here or there, you know, for example, even if those sites have actually even closed, But those sites have, you know, for example, Rocky Flats was a site in Colorado that had very specific work it did in terms of hazardous waste and such. And so it was really a specific site and the people who were there. So they do have long resumes. And so, you know, um, I think that's something to be aware of. In this industry specific, people need to make sure they understand that they have to list all that. Now, that's not the average rule by any stretch of the imagination. But in this industry, you would want to list everything. So but they. Do, and that is a real departure. departure. That, yeah. That's a big departure from other industries where you just yes. you really focus on the last 15 years. It's, it's, it's exactly. A, mm-hmm. It's a marketing brochure. It's not, and it's not a laundry list. And it, this yes. is a, that is a, that's a big difference. Right. It is. It's a big difference, but it's a really important one and it's very industry specific. So if you're applying for, you know, like a a, a Department of Defense or a Department of Energy job, or you're looking to apply applied for a federal job, those resumes are going to be much um, more extensive because they want to see all those years of experience and they want it for various reasons, not only to understand what your um, your host of experience is, but they want to understand, you know, how long you've held a clearance or what kind of work you've done or right. did you do graduate work as an intern at one of the laboratories in the country. So there are some really unique and specific ways they want to see all that work. So it is very different than other industries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so in terms of the behind the scenes, this is my fa- my favorite questions. Can you walk us through what goes on on your end between the time when a need is identified and a posting goes out? Sure. And so again, I think this very much depends on the industry you're in. I think it depends, Virginia, too, on what kind of recruiter you are. So, you know, as a corporate recruiter, okay. I've been with my current company two and a half years. And so in every case, I can tell you, I've worked with every hiring manager in the company. Now, I work for a small veteran owned company. And so, you know, I probably only deal with between five and 10, maybe 12 hiring managers total. Okay. Um, so not a huge number, but, you know, they, we've already gone through already gone through job searches together already in my two and a half years. So I've already built that rapport. So the more you have that rapport with the hiring manager, then the faster this process can go, right? It might be very different if it's, you know, for example, an agency recruiter, you know, and they may not know the client yet. So they may want to go on right. site and look at the site. So there's some, there's some nuances there to be, so you know, of. you know, the corporate culture already, you yes, know, the hiring exactly. manager style. Okay. So because I know all that and I know the three sites that, you know, we have offices in, they, so for example, we have one right now that's a subcontract specialist job. And so we've hired a couple other contract specialists this year. So when the hiring manager told me he had a need, I showed him the most recent posting that he and I had created together. He looked it over, made like one change to it. And I came back to him and asked him a question about whether it was on site or hybrid or, you know, remote work and something about the pay scale, the pay, the pay range. And I was off off to the races. And so I was okay, able to so you drop the, the job posting, you run it by him for approval. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, and mine's more casual than that. Again, it depends on the size of your business, Virginia. So I want to be sure. sensitive. You know, if you the bigger the company, sometimes the bigger the bureaucracy that comes from the time you get right. a request to the time it gets approved. So I, I've been in companies where there's a very formalized approval process. Yeah. Where there's the company, like, well, and so that's what I wanted to. So bet- yes. while you are drafting the posting and, you know, getting his final okay on it, are you starting to think about all that you know? So I am. I'm already, you know yeah, already, I'm already thinking. 
Yes, I'm already thinking right about that. And so for me, you know, it's not days. I mean, it's hours for me, right? From the time he says to me, he has the information. I ask a couple of follow-up questions because this has been such a recent request he's had. I'm very in tune with what he wants and what he's looking for. And so, okay. um, so within, you know, a few hours, the job's already posted on our website, on, you know, the uh, various um, job boards that we use. And then I begin to recruit. So, um, so it's pretty quick for us on my side, but I've been with companies that I worked quick. for, okay. I did. Yeah. I worked with companies where it takes days for those processes and those approvals to happen. So it just depends on the size of the company. So, okay. So where, where are your go-to sources for finding folks? Where do you look for so, talent? Yeah. And I, and this is going to be a random quite answer, but it, it does circle back. So if I had my drithers, you know, I would love for all our, rec all of our recruits to come from employee referrals. Right. I mean, I'd love for, right. you know, so this year about 40% of our new hires have come from employee referrals, which just thrills me to no end because they already have a built-in kind of mentor from the person who's referred them. And so I love to find them from my current employees. So I'm really mindful of new employees and asking them, Hey, I have another job, you know, in this area. Do you know anybody? And then here's the job posting. So I'll target current brand new employees who have just left their employer um, and ask them specifically, I have a new job. Do you know anybody? So I'll do that. I'll post the job through kind of an email distribution of all of our employees to see if anybody within our cohort might know of anybody. And then, of course, you know, um, and then, um, you, you know, the thing is, you never know. I mean, if someone were to tell you, Virginia, I'll know exactly where I'm going to find the next person. I think they're going to be lying to you because after 26 years of doing this, I'm always surprised at how I find people. It's, it is right. a very interesting. So I call it the tools in my tool belt as a recruiter. Okay. And there's a lot of tools. And so, you know, I post it on our website, obviously. I post it on Indeed. I post it on LinkedIn. I posted on clearancejobs.com and clearancejobs.com is a specific website for people with active clearances. And so um, I'll post them in those positions and then I'll passively start trying to find people, whether it be, you know, in connections through LinkedIn or through our employee referral process or through our active employee um, base. And then, you know, you do sourcing and searches, whether it be, you know, I know all the people I'm looking for are all part of this, you know, national association. So ASME, you know, the American Society of mechanical engineers, for example. And so if I can post it with that site specifically and target that group. So it really does depend on what the job is to know what okay. niches there are. And so the bigger the um, so, for example, in Albuquerque, there are there is a group of people who are contract specialists, but that group is tiny and 90 percent all work for the National Laboratory in town. So that group is not okay. always the best resource, for example, to okay. post a job because they all work for the same company. And normally that group doesn't move much because they're laboratory jobs. So it, it depends if that makes sense, you know, in terms of. Yeah, what no, but um, hopefully. It, it, but, but so you you know you post on a couple of niche job boards, the niche associations, the big guys like Indeed and LinkedIn and your website, of course, um, and then together with emails to new to new hires within your company, and then your internal emails. Um, how how long do you keep it open? And I mean, I would imagine you might even have enough just from step one that you don't even need to do step two. Right. So I so I always so because we're a federal contractor, there are some requirements we have right from an OFCCP. So from us, in, in order to okay. be compliant with our federal mandates, because we're a federal contractor of the U.S. government, there are some mandates. So jobs have to be kept open until they're filled. Right. So contrary to what you might read on LinkedIn or others, you know, this hidden job market um, that in my mind is really not very true. In my mind, you know, most jobs are always posted. And so there's an occasional job right where you'll just Hear about a job opening, but you haven't gotten all the specifics yet. And then maybe a case where I'm talking to a candidate and I go, you know, you may not be a good fit for this, but I have another job opening that might be coming in the next day or two. And when it opens, I'm going to send you the job posting so we can talk about that. Now that might yeah. happen occasionally, but I'll be yeah. honest, that doesn't, that's not routine for me, you know, in my space and the fact that I'm dealing with engineers and scientists with active security clearances, and I'm a federal contract company, you know, that's not going to be normal for us to have all these hidden jobs like I think in my mind that's that's not true that's not how it plays out and it hasn't played out over the course of my career that's not common in my industry so can you explain OC I'm going to get the initials wrong the OCC 
Oh, OFCCP. Mm -hmm. o it's, the oh, say, yeah, it's the office. Say one more time. OFCCP. Yeah, OFCCP. And I think if so I'm I know what it is, but walk through because I think there's a lot of people that don't understand. Sure. So OFCCP is the Office of the Federal Compliance, basically, program. And it means that if you're a company that works with the government, the U.S. government, and you have contracts, you're, if you're a federal contract company, so for example, the company I work for, TechSource, we work with the Department of Energy and we have some Department of Defense work. So because of that, we have to abide by these OFCCP guidelines. And so they can be all kinds of different things. So for example, on the most simplistic level, it means every job I have, it must be posted. It means that I have to be able to track because annually I'm required to complete paperwork and documentation from the HR department about how we found people. So for example, in the course of a year, how many jobs were posted? How many people applied? How many people got to interview stage? How many people you know, were hired? And so they want to see um, from OFCCP perspective, they want to see a very clear delineation from the time a job was open to the time a job was closed and who was hired. And so there is there are compliance requirements that we have. So for example, you know, um, on a basic level, right, an equal opportunity employer, right? You know, from a federal perspective, we have to comply with federal regulations in terms of not only yeah. how we post jobs and how we document the process for every candidate, but we also have to ensure that we are, um, we are um, compliant with federal mandates regarding equal opportunity employer um, and that we're treating every candidate with, you know, fairness and equity in every phase of the process. So I have a question for you on that. Um, companies that have a federal component like a like Amazon or, a, you know, like a price waterhouse, they they work with corporations, but then they also have a federal sector. So they are all the roles still under the OFCCP guidelines? Yeah, OFCCP I know what you're asking. That. I don't know. Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Every company I've worked for who does OFCCP work, I mean, who does federal contracting work, so much of their work is federal that, I mean, it's 80 to 90%, yeah, if not yeah, 100%. Yeah. And so we, I've never been, well, that's not true. I worked for a company um, just a few years ago that was not in the federal sector. And, and sometimes it was kind of shocking to me just because I'm so used to this sector. So, you know, so for example, and this is a simple one, but because we're a federal co um, contractor, we have to prepare every year an affirmative action plan. So we have mm -hmm. to document how many people we interviewed and how many people we hired and, you know, and document that from an affirmative action plan perspective, an AAP, which you don't have to do by federal mandate if you're not a federal contractor, for example. And so, you know, there's just some compliance issues you're required to do if you are a federal contract company. And so that's one I can think okay. of. Now, now I'm going to ask around because I have seen recruiters on Twitter reference OFCCP and I always wondered, I suspect they follow the protocol yes. regardless of if they're if they are, I guess, is if any of their businesses, they probably, I mean, you probably, I mean, my, my experience as a recruiter is, you know, you always want to go with the most conservative approach, right? You know, mm -hmm. and if that, if the federal contracts, yeah. you know, management, then, you know, it's just easier to do it with all than to pick and choose, right? So, I mean, okay, yeah. I, would, I would assume that that'd be the case, but I don't know how big Amazon's, you know, recruiting group is and how much right. they segment out, you know, their commercial to your point versus their federal work. Mm -hmm. But I would guess the companies I worked for, because so much of the work is federal contract work, then we've always used the same guidelines for all the work. That makes total sense. So following those guidelines, 40% of your new hires come through internal channels. Um, do you have any sense for the breakdown of which ones then come from people that you found through your your external searches or are in response to people that responded to your the indeeds in the LinkedIn yeah. and the clearance? Yeah. So I mean, so this year, yeah, about 39 to 41 percent of the new hires this year have come from employee referrals. And so the rest okay. have come from you know other sources. So um usually um Indeed tends to be the most common way we'll find people, even in the security space, right? I mean, it's the most okay. common is through Indeed.com. And then LinkedIn is certainly a, a second, but it's certainly a distant second. So it just depends. Okay. You know, um, 
So for example, as an example, um, it's hard to tell on LinkedIn profiles whether somebody has a security clearance or not, Virginia. And that's yeah. really a big deal to me, right? I mean, I need to know that you're a US citizen and I need to know that you have a security clearance. Um, so, and actually, if you have a security clearance and you already are a citizen, but there are cases where I don't have, you don't have to have a clearance to get the job with us, but you have to be able to be clearable, meaning that you yeah. have to be a US citizen and be able to obtain and maintain a security clearance. And that's not always very clear in LinkedIn. And so it's one of the things that I find challenging about trying to find people on LinkedIn is that it's rarely communicated on anywhere in their profile. Well, it's interesting you say that because I remember years ago, I was writing for one of the defense contractors that had split at the IC when they'd done a big split. And I was writing and I was given feedback that I should not be sharing information about their clearances in LinkedIn for security purposes. Oh, mm -hmm. um, an OPSEC perspective. Yeah. Operational yeah, security. Um, but that yeah. is a disadvantage for the job seeker. So I wonder, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. So, I mean, I think that's always, you know, they call it OPSEC, right? O-P-S-E-C. -E and so they kind of call it like, you know, operational, like um, the, the term means, I'm not sure I know exactly what it what Operational acronym. security? Yeah. So it's operational security. So what it means is, you know, do you really want people to target you because you have an active security right. clearance, right? Um, so, I mean, I think there's always that risk. I think it depends on how you're using social media, right? I think it's, you know, I think it's a bigger picture and a bigger conversation than just your LinkedIn profile. So if you're talking about SAIC days, you're probably talking about SAIC, but then breaking up with Lidos, right? So back yeah, in the day. Yeah, or, which is yeah, which how long ago yeah. was that, yeah. And so, and that's more <laughs> Department of Defense work. But um, so, I mean, I think there is a piece to that. So clearancejobs.com, you know, could help solve that problem because everybody on that right, site, you know, right. is supposed to have a clearance. but. Um, I think, you know, I think it depends on you as a person. I mean, it doesn't serve anybody well if they apply for a job. So, for example, I have a current job in D.C. and it's for an executive assistant, but it's supporting the DOE headquarters office in downtown D.C. in the forest stall building. And you have to have a current top secret, a Department of Defense clearance or an active Q clearance, which is a DOE clearance. And if you choose not to list your clearance on your resume, then I'm going to I'm going to struggle with figuring out whether you're minimally qualified. Right. right. And so so that becomes a challenge. So I think I think they tell people, you know, from an OPSEC perspective, you know, be mindful of how you communicate your clearance in various social networks. But in my mind, and this may be, you know, not something people agree on LinkedIn, to the most part, really is a networking business site versus something like Facebook, for example, in my mind. I think yeah. there still is, in my mind, a delineation between the two. So if you're on LinkedIn because you want to network and you have a current clearance, then I think it's in your best interest to mention it, right? I mean, I think that's the best way. But, you know, you do always want to be mindful and wise about how you're interacting with people on your LinkedIn network. But I don't know why you would hide that on LinkedIn. Um, I mean, and you don't have to go into that's true. It's not like you're sharing it on TikTok, right? Right, right. Well, I hope you're not, but people do. Right. So, and that's a different conversation entirely. But yeah, I mean, I do think there's a, a time and a place to, you know, to specify on um, any kind of site that you're specifically looking for work or networking opportunities. So I think LinkedIn would fall under that category, as would, you know, okay. Indeed or your resume or such. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's super helpful. Um, all right, I'd love to move on to ATS or Applicant Tracking and Software Systems, um, yes. which there's just so much out there across the uh, the Google sphere about it and what's wrong with it and how it will reject you, your resume, um, what it can and what it can't read. This is where I'd love for us to talk like we are we kindergartners. Um, can you explain it to us, how you sure. use it and how it how it how how it's used? Let's go with that. Sure. So an applicant tracking system or an ATS is really a database. And in most in the most simple form, it really does two things. It tracks every job and it tracks every candidate. And that's kind of, I mean, as simple as it is, that's what the that's what the purpose is of an ATS. And so an applicant tracking system will post every job. And then it'll track every candidate who's applied for that position and how far along they've gotten in that application and recruiting process for each job. So the benefit of that for me, as I said earlier, from like an OFCCP perspective is when we pull our reports on an annual basis for affirmative action, then we can say, 
you know, how many jobs we had open, how many candidates applied, sure. how many were oh, interviewed. Gosh, I can't imagine doing that reporting without. Right. Right. And applicant <laughs> yeah. tracking systems have changed tremendously, Virginia. I mean, I remember back in the day when they were like the most basic of basic back in the, you know, late 90s, right? Yeah, compared to come where they are now. Way. But I was at an OFCCP conference a few years ago um, and people, it was a room of about 100 recruiters and the speaker said, well, how many of you raise your hand if you like your ATS? And like two people in the room <laughs> raised their hand. It just made me laugh. And so applicant tracking systems like are the, you know, the bane of our existence as recruiters because, you know, they're not. Well, my opinion is they're not built with recruiters in mind. You know, I mean, you never get somebody who can build an ATS from a software perspective that has the the um, subject matter expert as a recruiter in the room. Right. So, I mean, so there's some yeah. interesting nuances of that. But basically, an ATS just tracks every job and it tracks every candidate. And it's as simple as that. So when people start talking about, well, you know, they knocked me out. That's a different you need to understand what that means. So let me be clear. So. Um, I had a job posting on LinkedIn right now and it and they allow you on LinkedIn and most job sites to put screening questions on your postings. So after I create my posting, it'll say, Nicole, do you want to create some screening questions? And so one of them, for example, is do you have an active Department of Defense TS or top secret clearance or do you have an active Department of Energy Q clearance? And that's our screening okay. question. You have to say yes to that question for you to be minimally qualified because it's okay. a minimum qualification of the job. And so in cases like that, that screening question, if you don't have a clearance, then you're not being considered, right? And so people have a hard time hearing that and candidates feel like that's not fair. And there's all kinds of conversations I've heard and been involved with over 20 some years of people saying, well, I don't like that. Well, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not, right? And I'm not I'm not lacking in empathy for people who feel like, well, I can't get a clearance or I don't have a clearance. So why am I not being considered? That's a whole different conversation, okay. but that's a screening question. And so screening questions are different than an applicant tracking system. So, so the screening, screening questions system is knocking you out, not the ATS rejection. Yes, you. right. Okay. And the screening question is knocking you out because so if you look, for example, at a minimum requirement, so on my jobs, I'll say, you know, your opportunity, then I'll say what you'll do, and then I'll say what you'll need, right? And then I'll go into, you know, the company so you can get some information on the company. Mm -hmm. But under what you'll need, I, I list those top four to five things you have to have to be minimally qualified for the job. And candidates, in my experience, and this hasn't been, this hasn't changed in 26 years, they don't read it or they don't acknowledge it and they yeah. just simply apply and so if I get, so if I, so for example, two days ago, I had 26 people like resumes I looked at on LinkedIn who applied for my executive assistant job. And the two things I listed, one of them was, you know, do you live in the DC area? Because you have to be on site, you know, or the metro area of DC. And do you live in that area? Because you have to be on site every day. And secondly, do you have an active, you know, TS or Q clearance? Mm -hmm. And every single person who applied did not. Every single one. And so screening questions are a way for us as recruiters to manage big, heavy workloads, right? So, I mean, yeah. if we know that minimum requirement and people think, oh, Nicole, that's just a suggestion. No, it's not. Minimum requirements, from my perspective, as a technical recruiter for a federal contract company, is those are those are deal breakers. You have to have that you have to have that skill or in this case that clearance or you don't meet the minimum requirements and you will okay. not be considered. There's no exceptions to that. Okay, that is super helpful. Um, I know that there's a, you know, what, 300 different ATS systems and everything is different, but if you were to yes. generalize, what are things on resumes that you feel get lost in the shuffle when they go through, when ATS is, uh, is organizing them and tracking them? Yeah. So, you know, even all these years later, like, you know, ATSs don't do well with parsing, which means the ATSs don't as advanced as things are with technology. Most applicant tracking systems don't parse resumes well, meaning that if your resume is not in a standard format, then it's probably not going to serve you well. So my experience is if you're, you know, if your resume is sexy looking, meaning that, you know, it's got lots of bells and whistles and it's got some interesting formatting and different colors and different designs on it. And it's got pictures and 
crafts, the more complex looking your resume is, my experience is the harder it is for an applicant tracking system to parse it. Parsing meaning P-A-R-S-I-N-G, meaning that the, the, the system has a harder time figuring out where to put information because the way you've organized it or the way you've designed it is more complex than the average resume. So I tell people really, and unless you're a graphic designer or you're in a job that specifically you need to have a resume that's highly um, visual because you're in a visual art or more on the art side of the you know, house in terms of your industry, the simpler your resume looks, the better off you are, would be my general rule. So templates like you see in Canva um, that are super design focused yes. in my mind. Do you, uh, and for your industry, it sounds like definitely wouldn't work. What are your, uh, and I, my feeling, it, I don't like writing within those because they give you so little room for the text and yes. it needs to be king. Um, right. But it sounds like those fall into the, most ATSs are going to struggle with those. They are. And my experience is people just don't know. So they think, oh, you know, it's, I mean, I know the mentality, right? I have two young adult children. And so they're like, oh, mom, you know, let me do this. And I'm like, no, you know, let me just give you a template, you know? So it's a real right. simple like a, one. Yeah, and, yeah. and I have yeah. it and I've used it for 20 years and I give it to candidates all the time. So they, if they struggle, right. If they're just getting out of the military and they're struggling with Nicole, what should it look like? You know, here's a template, right. you know? And so um, I find that to your point, it's not only that the ATSs don't parse those resumes well, it's also the fact that those resumes, those templates are very restrictive and you don't realize that when you're beginning to use them, right? You think, oh, this is a kind of a neat look and then I'll start typing things in, but then it'll force you, you know, as you know, Virginia, it'll force you to, to you know, um, to capitalize things or to move things or the, the or yeah, the, the, crazy. The, the, yeah, the margins are hinky. <laughs> yes. And you can't change that. Right. So that's one of the things that people don't think about when they first get into looking at a template they find online is that you're then like locked into that. And so your ability to like, you know, use bullet points differently or want to expand on that, they just don't give you that space or the margins. And so then you're dealing with like having to deal with like template issues and margins. And you're now having to have like, you know, an advanced knowledge of word or this template to fix it. And so really the best thing, you know, my opinion is just make it simple, right? The purpose of your resume is to make sure that people understand what you do and how you do it, um, your job titles, your job duties, your accomplishments, your education. And then it's, it's just that introduction, right? And so make yeah. it as simple and as clean okay. and as crisp as possible. Really good advice. Now, what are your, a lot of people ask me, does a recruiter look at every resume that comes in that, that you know, that didn't get knocked out? Or do they look at, you know, look to they do searches in within the ATF to to pick out pick and choose so I think that depends really on the job Virginia yeah. and on the industry yeah. so right I mean I'm in an industry where I mean I'm not going to have 75 people apply for a mechanical engineer with you know creo design experience with an active security clearance right i'm just not i mean that's just been the reality of my situation my whole career so i am going to review every resume um and so in my industry you know engineering degrees are serious about those degrees right I mean, i've been reading articles about well you know they're gonna their companies are changing their requirements for yeah. degrees yeah. not in my industry right it's a deal okay. breaker so Right. So um, so I'm going to always look at engineer. I'm going to look at everyone's resume. I'm going to look at, you know, typically the easiest thing to find out first is, you know, what their education is. So I'm going to review education typically first just to kind of see what they have. Do they have a bachelor's? Do they have a master's? What do they have it in? You know, is it in mechanical? Is it in electrical? What's it in? Um, and then I'm going to look at the resume and make sure that I understand what it looks like. So a pet peeve of mine with resumes um, besides what I just talked about it being so busy and so design focused that you can't figure out what to look for in a resume if, if, if resumes get that busy looking is resumes that are written like a novel. And so, you know, I tell people, you know, your resume needs to be something that can be easily read and absorbed by somebody. Right. And so, you know, you need to have bullet points. You need to have white space. You need to have good right and left margins. It needs to be clear on your resume who you are and what you do. And if you can't communicate that on a resume, you're probably not going to get very far as a job seeker. And so, you know, so I look at every resume, but, you know, like my example about the LinkedIn, you know, um, I looked at the screening questions 
And then I looked at what their resumes were and it was clear that they didn't have a security clearance. So there was no need to go further than that because yeah, the job yeah, yeah. required you, a even, security even clearance. Even though those people didn't pass the, not the screening questions, you still looked at that resume. I do. So I think there's, and, and, I'm, yeah, and I don't know what if, you know, big companies tend to have bigger staffs reviewing resumes, but I do feel like there's a misnomer that recruiters don't look at resumes. They let the ATF sort of let certain ones bubble to the top and they only look at a sliver of them. So I think it depends too. So, uh, so let me give you another example though. So I had a remote US-based, US citizen, remote graphic designer job and I posted it on LinkedIn. And in the first day I had over 200 oh. people apply. Yeah. And, and I mean, and there's no way I can manage that level, right? I mean, with other jobs, I mean, so I started looking at the jobs. I probably looked at the, the first 50, 75 people who applied um, and then started figuring out, you know, who the best candidates were based on their experience and background and what we were looking for. So, I mean, it does depend on the okay. job in cases, right? I mean, that's to be transparent and no one likes to hear this. So I'm not trying to upset anybody or, you no, know, that's, get hate really, mail. that's really good advice. Um, but I mean, so, but so, it, so here's the deal. If you find a job that you like, you need to apply as soon as possible. Right. I mean, you know, don't really dally is, around. If it looks like if it's a, if it's a super competitive opportunity where you're going to get dozens and dozens of people, especially if you're looking at LinkedIn and you're posting on Indeed. I mean, you're going to get people from multiple places. Time is time is of the essence. Do you sort it of is. feel like 24, 48 hours is vital? Yeah, it is. And so, and people, you know, and so it, it, so that's another dynamic in it, right? So, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, if you, so if you start looking for jobs and don't look, I mean, I just put a post on here today about it and LinkedIn, um, you know, if you're looking for a job, then be very intentional, like make sure your resume is up to date, make sure it's updated and it's clear about, you know, what your resume is trying to communicate about what you want and what your background and experience has been, you know, make sure that you're intentional because I, what I see is that sometimes people just kind of, it's like throwing spaghetti on a wall and people just kind of throw their resume at things and they're not intentional. And so that, you know, I can think of a candidate who's applied for like four jobs with us over the last year and never been qualified for any of them. And I think yeah, ah, no, people, yeah. people don't. And the, the, the job postings are a treasure trove of information. Those minimum qualifications they really are can be. Yes, mm -hmm. they can yeah. be. And I'm very intentional. I mean, I, I don't think it's so for, so to, as much as I expect something from you as a candidate about your resume, I think you should expect from me a job posting that's clear and crisp and helps you understand what this job is, where it is, what's happening with this job, what you'll be doing, what you'll need to be successful. And so it's usually no more than two pages at the most. It's usually about a page and it's very succinct. And my hiring managers, because of who they are, they want, you know, to list every possible job duty and then put, you know, more other duties as, and I'm like, no, we don't need to list that on the job posting. And so I have to work with them and remind them that this is really an advertisement. You know, we can talk more about the job and such, you know, when we phone screen people, but we need to make sure that they understand what the job requires. But to your point, Virginia, it is, it should be very clear. If you're applying for jobs and you don't really understand what you're applying for, then that's probably an issue too, right? And so and know, that could be a host of different reasons, but I really use a job postings intentionally in terms of making sure. So then, you know, someone will call me. So this EA job I was telling you about, the executive admin job in DC, I've had at least a couple of people tell me, well, I don't want to be on site every day. And my answer is, you know, as patiently and as politely as possible, that's what the posting says it is. Right. So that's if you don't want to work to the job posting, okay. Yeah, right? And I don't no. want to be rude, but I'm like, I was really clear in the posting. The posting says the job's on site. You know, this is a, a security clear job on site at a federal DOE facility. You have to be on site. Well, I don't want to be. No, nope. I understand. Well, I wish you well, but this isn't going to probably be the right fit. For you. Say, right. So in, in terms of vetting, you've already alluded to some things that, you know, you look at someone's education. Um, what are other things that you are looking at? regardless of the type of role it is to determine if someone is worth a call? I guess that's my first question. My second is what are, what are red flags to you? Yeah. So, um, you know, I spend a lot of time as a recruiter looking at resumes. So if your resume exhausts me, then I probably won't call you. And it sounds like a crazy thing to say, but I mean, like, as my example earlier said, if your resume looks like a novel and I have to read it like a novel, 
after like the first 20, 30, 40 lines, I'm like, oh my gosh, my eyes are going to yeah. fall out of my head. And so, you know, you <laughs> need to have a resume that's clean and clear and crisp and communicates it. So use bullet points, use your right and left margin, make sure that it's really clear your headings and that you've updated it. I bet in the last two weeks, I've had four or five people say, oh, well, I'm not there anymore. Well, but your resume says, oh, well, I'm not there anymore. And my first thought is, oh my goodness, can you please submit a resume that's up to date? I mean, I don't think that's a hard question. Clean and current. <laughs> and, and they don't, right? I mean, that's not an uncommon phenomenon. And so, you know, make sure as a job, I have responsibilities and I have a lot, right, as a recruiter to you as a candidate, but you have some responsibilities too. And some of them is it needs to be clean and crisp and clear and it needs to be current, your resume. And if you left a job three months ago or if you had a contract change and your contract ended in July, then by all means state that on your resume. Um, you know, I'm going to look for education. I'm going to look for experience, right? So if it's a job that requires five years experience as a graphic designer and you have one, then, you know, we're done, right? I mean, I'm done looking at your resume, okay. right? I mean, that's just how it goes. And, 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 and it sounds harsh and I don't mean for it to sound harsh, but, you know, when you're looking at trying to find, you're trying to hire people for various jobs and you're one person doing this, your job and responsibilities are to try to find the people who are most qualified for those positions. So if somebody, everybody's able to apply for any job they want. So if you want to apply for a job and it says five years minimum experience and you only have one, you're free to apply, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be considered, right? And so I think that's what candidates don't understand is that, to your point earlier, you really do need to read the job description to understand what they're asking for, whether it be on-site or, or remote, or whether it be the clearance is required, or you have to have this education, or you have to have this experience. So it's important. So when people say to me, I've applied for 120 jobs and I haven't gotten anywhere, you know, what I find often is that they their resume is not tailored to their background or experience or they're really new in the job field and they don't really know what they want to be looking for or they're applying for jobs for which they're not minimally qualified and so you know that's important i think those are all important things and i think that sometimes job candidates don't understand that those are like the basics that's recruiting 101 right don't apply for a job if you don't meet the educational requirement, or if you don't meet the clearance requirement, or if you have one year experience and it asks for a minimum of five. So I think that candidates think those are suggestions. And in my well, industry, and, what I do, they're not suggestions. They're not, right. And I right. see a lot of job postings where it has, I call them like need to have and nice to have. Yes, preferences, and, yeah. Requirements versus yeah. like preferences. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And so when people say, well, you, if you meet 70% of the requirements and you're probably good to go, I feel like that's fine in the nice to have and the preferences, but the requirements, you really need to have them. You do. They're and again, it depends on the industry, right? So if I have three requirements and one's a bachelor's degree minimum in engineering, and you have to have five years of experience and you have to have an active clearance, the only one that has any wiggle room whatsoever is the years of experience. And I would say even that's marginal. If you've got three and a half years or four years or four and a half, I think, you know, you might depend on what kind of work you've done, right? I mean, it, there's a little bit of that too, right? If you've worked for a Department of Energy laboratory in a very specialized area, you might meet that five-year requirement at three years or three and a half or four. But, um, but the other two, there's no wiggle room at all. If you have a secret clearance that this job requires a top secret clearance, it doesn't matter that you have a secret. That doesn't cut it, unfortunately. And so you're not going to be minimally qualified. So to your point, you know, most of my minimum requirements are hard requirements. They're not flexible. The preferences are. So the preference being, you know, you know, five years of nuclear operations experience at a you know commercial new, you know, nuclear site. You know, that might be a preference, but the, the requirements. Our requirements and i don't think yeah. candidates understand that yeah they so. don't they don't and, and, and sort of breaking down that job posting i think is i, I yes. think that's really insightful so thank you um so let's shift gears i want to ask you about being ghosted there's okay. people ghost on both sides i'm sure you have had candidates ghost you um but i know that people struggle with what do I do so that I'm not a pet, but that I'm still showing interest? What What are things that are going on when people aren't hearing back and how should they navigate that? It feels right. like a minefield. 
It is. And I think it is. And um, I would say, you know, I got laid off in early COVID. Um, I got laid off in April of 2020 and a local company in town that does, you know, security cleared kind of work in my area of expertise, engineers and scientists contacted me. We had a phone screen and it was actually a phone interview. It wasn't just a phone screen. And they said at the end of the interview, you, you know, you did a great job. I really want to pursue you further. Can you send me your references? Absolutely. Like within an hour or two, I sent it to the person and next day and didn't hear any confirmation or thank you that they received it. You know, so I left a voicemail message. I left an email message, nothing. Right. So, I mean, I want everybody to know it happens to everybody and I'm Mm -hmm. never saying it's acceptable, but it is common. And so it's frustrating. I think the reason people take it so personally is because job searches are they're painstaking, right? I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. painful process. Nothing about job searches. Tend, nobody says, I love job searching and I love interviewing. It's the funnest thing I've ever done. I mean, nobody says that, right? So, and so you have so much writing on every interview yeah. on every job. And so the reason people get take it, get so upset is because it feels so personal, but the reason, the truth is it's not right. I mean, I know how that feels and I, and I'm really committed to contacting every person that so when you apply for a job for me you're going to hear from me you're going to hear from me and i'm going to give you a rejection email if you don't meet the minimum qualifications if you apply through indeed or if you apply through linkedin i am incredibly conscientious about that but i'm going to tell you that not everybody is and part of it is you know they may be new to the field right virginia they may be so early in career that they don't understand the repercussions if you don't do that right they may right. be that they are in lots of jobs that you've seen that a lot now with recruiters being burnt out and they just have huge heavy requisition loads meaning that they have anywhere from you know 30 to 100 requisitions that they personally own and they've got to review resumes for all these individuals and get back to these hiring managers and so it could just be a workload issue um, i'm not yeah. saying it's acceptable but I think that's part of the reason that sometimes you just don't hear back. Or if they do a phone screen with you and it just wasn't a good fit. And instead of trying, so maybe you're, maybe you realize at the end of the phone screen, I realize as a, as a recruiter that they're not a good fit. And I begin to tell them that, and they want to argue with me. This happened recently. And the person's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, you know, this isn't probably going to be a good fit for what your background is and what you're looking for and what we need. And he just, and this person just wanted to get into it with me. And so I repeated my response again and ended the call. But, you know, I will tell you that my experience with recruiters is all over the map over 26 years. And there are some that I really, you know, have kindred spirits with. And I think, you know, we are always in line. And then there are others where I think they're like used car salespeople. And so it it does run the gamut. There's always, there's always great people, bad apples and everything in the middle, right? There is. And so I find that in this industry, people don't like confrontation. And so some recruiters are really good at it, but a lot of recruiters just don't want to do it. And so rather than tell you at the end of the phone screen that it wasn't a good fit and that we're not going to pursue you, then they're just not going to move forward with you. Right. So, I mean, I think sometimes the ghosting might be an avoidance of conflict, which may mean that, you know, they just don't think it's a good fit. The truth is, if you're a good fit they'll contact you. And so that's, but nobody likes to hear that. Right. But what, but what you don't know as a candidate is what's that time frame, right? What, how much time does that look? Is that, so what I would say is it gives you some peace of mind to contact them. So you can, my recommendation would be call them, you know, email them once a week, you know, for the, the, the next three weeks, explain what job that you talk to them about and explain to them, you know, your continued interest and asking, you know, um, what the status of that job might be and what the, what the time frame might be and see if they get back to you right um i think it's i think every day is an eternity when you're a job candidate looking for a job and i'm super sensitive to that that's not the time that's not the mindset of recruiters right they have other things going on in the tyranny of the urgent but i think as a job seeker you know every moment you're not hearing from somebody is excruciating pain and i recognize that and so i try to be so conscientious to let everybody know and I get and I get back with everybody. If I, you've applied for a job, if I phone screened you, if you've interviewed for, with my hiring manager on a job, whether you get the job or not, I will call you, and I will let you know you didn't get the job. Oh, I once will. A week, every single you know, case that feels that that feels like a good time frame for yes, not being a tag, but I want to show one right. continued interest. 
Right. Yeah. And if after a third time, after three weeks, you're not hearing anything. I mean, there's always a chance that, you know, the person was out on, you know, the person was out sick with COVID. I mean, who knows these days, right? You know, or, or they had a right. family member out sick or something. But after three weeks, if you don't hear anything, you know, I would say to you, your best assumption would be that the job's no longer being considered for you and move on. Right. And if right. for some or, reason they or the job got put on hold or so, you know, who yes, knows? who knows? Right. It's so hard to know. Right. I mean, you're in a black box. You have no idea as a candidate what's going on. And it could be it could be that an internal candidate. Right. All of a sudden threw their hat into the ring and they were interviewed and they were chosen. Now, why that person didn't tell you that? I mean, and that's you know, I don't know why can't why hiring managers right. or re recruiters don't tell you that. But there could be a host of reasons that a job is no longer, you know, and I, what I always hear is, well, you know, I was a good fit. I was a perfect fit. Well, you don't really know if you were a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always, yeah. you never know who you're competing against. And that's, and that's hard right. for candidates to hear. You never know who you're competing against. And it could be an internal person. It could be a former employee, like a boomerang employee who's coming back to the company. Sure. It could be, yeah. I mean, there could be a host of reasons that you never even thought about. Brilliant scenarios. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, really good. So in terms of, Faux pas in job search. You you told me your pet peeves around resumes. You know, do design heavy. They read like a novel. No white space bullets. What is your what other do you have like sort of a top pet peeve or think mistake that you see people making over and over again that just drives you nuts? So I try, you know, as a recruiter with a long history in recruiting, I try really hard to let things go. <laughs> you know, it helps. It helps all of us. Um, one of the things I would say is when people put the burden of their job search on you as a recruiter, meaning that like all of a sudden they'll send me a message and say, well, you know, I have this experience. Can you help me find a job? And I, I hear this talked about all the time on LinkedIn. I mean, I'm very careful in my LinkedIn profile to tell you who I am and what I do. Right. I mean, I I hire engineers and scientists that have security clearances. So, I mean, I tell you from the get-go who I am. So when you apply, so when you send me a message saying, hey, I'm an IT professional who lives, you know, out of the country, not doesn't live in the U.S. Yeah, that, that, you can't help I'm, them, I'm, yeah. Yeah, and so I can't help you, right? And so I just think it's interesting when people put the burden of responsibility for their job search on you as a recruiter. Now, we tend to be a pretty helpful bunch, recruiters do, you know, and we're happy to yeah, help you give you questions. But I think, man, like that's not my responsibility to fix your job search issue, right? I mean, that's your responsibility. And if you do have a fit for what I have, then by all means, you know, we can go further in the process. But I read a lot about it. And I think people are very consistent in sending me emails or, or DMs, you know, through LinkedIn saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm an IT professional and I'm, you know, I'm in, I don't know where, you know, India, for example, and I want you to find me a job. And I'm like, mm. So there's a lot of things wrong with that picture, in my mind, mm -hmm. right? You're not a U.S. Right, citizen, right, right. IT recruiting. And so that's probably a big pet peeve. I think the other one is, is that, and I call it scorned lover behavior, Virginia. People act like that, you know, I'm doing them wrong sometimes. And it doesn't happen a lot, you know, and I've done it a long time. So I, I'm pretty thick skinned like an elephant. But when people decide that, like, they're going to take it not only personally, but they're going to get um, combative with you. And they're going to get real ugly. And I, it, it happens sometimes. And you never know what job it's going to be on. And you never know what person it's going to be. But when people decide to get really nasty and ugly, and they start taking it all personally at a level that's like you've broken up with them, you know, a scorned lover kind of level. And I'm yeah. always amazed by that because what, so what is the upside of that? I know I don't understand. Right. There's no upside. Yes. It's a short, short, maybe you feel good for five seconds, but long term, you certainly lost that long term the potential of it being a long-term networking relationship. Exactly. And so I can think about this. So we had somebody this earlier this year who applied for a job and just wasn't quite really the fit, but we had another opportunity that was, and the guy handled it when I told him that it wasn't really a strong fit for the first job. He handled it with such grace and, and um, respect that it really struck me. And so when his other job came up, like literally within a week, you know, I was able to reach out to him about another opportunity and he was a great fit and he's an employee of Mars, right? And he'll say to you, you know, he'll, he'll say, you know, Nicole really was able to like, let me know what job was a better fit for me and help me find the right place at TechSource. And so to, to your point, when you burn those bridges, when you get snotty and you act like a scorned lover, you know, and I'm guessing there are maybe situations where that's warranted. I don't know. You know, I, I, I can't think of an example where it would be, but I'm sure there are. 
But when you choose to do that, you know, you are burning a bridge and it's a bridge that you really can't repair. I mean, I have people who get sometimes nasty with me and send me these ugly emails. And then three months later, they're asking me for a job. And I'll just go back and say, you know, your email from this date indicated that you didn't want to work with me. So I wish you the best. And so, you know, but it's a bad idea, right? You, you know, when you burn those bridges and, and, and in my industry, for example, it's a really small one, Virginia, and people talk. Yeah. And so, I mean, and recruiters love talking about candidates who misbehaved. It's like a favorite, it's a favorite conversation of ours because it's kind of funny sometimes. And so we, we joke about it. So, I mean, people's names come up and situations. <laughs> So it's a small industry. And when you cut, a, when you burn a bridge, like people remember that, right? And so you want to be really careful that you're really, that you don't take it personally. And you just realize this is part of the frustrations that come with it and, and not kick, the, not, not have that kick the dog syndrome, right? You need support right, to help right. you. you're having a hard time. And I certainly empathize with how frustrating job searches are. Um, I have, I've been a job searcher myself and I understand how hard it can be, but don't take it out on the messenger, right? It's not usually the best way to handle your frustrations or your anger. You can handle it perhaps in a better way. Yeah, very good, very good points, all of them. And mind your manners. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, and I know, and I'm kind of big on respect, right? I mean, I'm going to be respectful to you of your time. I'm going to, you know, make sure I'm cordial. I'm very polite in all my email and my communication with you. So I'd like for you to be polite with me. And so when you're not, it's frustrating. I mean, you know, it happens. So I'm not unaware of it. I live in this world, but I think it's important to be respectful. It goes a long way. I agree. It does. Please and thank you. All of those, they never go out of yes, smile. Yes, thank you. Learning I, kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Nicole, my very last question, my favorite one, you have been recruiting for 20 years. Um, you share so much insight and in wisdom on LinkedIn. Tell me what is next for you in 2023. Um, you know, I, I'm one of these rare birds that really loves recruiting. And I don't know very many people who started out with me 26 years ago who are still recruiters. They've branched out into other industries. I love recruiting. And so the company I work for is tremendous and they, they're a great employer. So I think we're going to have some great opportunities for hiring in 2023, I think locally in Albuquerque, which is always exciting that I get to hire people and I actually get to see them because they live local yeah. and I get to hire them. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's just doing more of the same, you know, recruiting, working okay. with people, trying to educate people on LinkedIn and educate job seekers about, you know, what they can do to make their job search less painful and more successful um, and just continuing to be, you know, a recruiter that really does want to support people and, and it hopefully best represents my, um, my industry and my, and my calling, you know, as a recruiter. I know that, you know, there are people out there that um, are, you know, are hurting people, you know, and, and basically, you know, um, breaking, you know, candidates, you know, spirits by not getting back to them and not doing the most a reputable thing. And so I'm hoping that I'm out there as a positive force for recruiters that people may recognize that, you know, there's some wonderful people who take their jobs as recruiters very seriously and passionately. Well, that, that is obvious. And I have shared on your bio, a link to your LinkedIn profile so that people can follow you there. Uh, but Nicole, right. thank you so much. You have done just a tremendous job of explaining so much that happens behind the curtain and um, just shed a lot of light on on the process. So really, really appreciate it. No, thank you for the opportunity, Virginia. I could talk about recruiting for days. So I appreciate the time and thank you for giving me a chance to talk about and hopefully revealing some important things to job seekers as they go through this search themselves. You've been listening to The Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's online CM hiring and decision makers, please visit www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.